you're in the presence of God. God's so good to us. God provides in so many ways. And our heart's cry tonight should be to be near the cross. Sing that chorus with him one time. <laughs> Don't you feel sorry for those that aren't here tonight? They miss that. Thank you so much. He said, what, what do I do? I have no idea, folks. After that, what do you do? I told him, be a Baptist, take an offer. Well, let's have the ushers come up. Let's do uh... Let's turn, turn to 281. And, uh, Jason, would you lead us in prayer? This will be church offering, and a little bit later on in the service, we'll take an offering from Brother Tika. And uh, while I'm speaking of, of that, uh, some have asked if you want to give a check, make it out to Lakeside, we'll make sure it goes to Brother Tika. So this one is church offering. We'll take another one later. souls to rescue there are souls 
We're proud that you're here tonight, and we're proud that Brother Tika and his wife are with us this evening, and uh, we're just looking for a good time in the Word of God. As we are about to go to the Lord in prayer, I know there's many requests that you might have, but uh, if you'll just offer those up to the Lord, uh, we might not hear them, we might not know what they are. But uh, aren't you glad that you serve a God? Somebody asked me one time when they came here, and you know, typically we we sometimes have altar prayer. And this is probably about three, four years ago. And someone said, how does God sort out everybody talking at the same time? And I thought for a moment, the only thing came to me was he's God. <laughs> and that's true, though. Really, it is. He interacts with every single one of us, and yet all of our interactions that we have with him are based on what we have with other people. It's amazing uh, about God. I was in class this week and doing some teaching, and I was teaching some neuroanatomy, and one of the ladies spoke up, and she was of a Muslim faith, and she said, how anybody could not believe that there's a God is beyond me when you start looking at the human body. Well, uh, she didn't believe the same way we do. Her God's a different God than our God, but she was right in what she said. And uh, so as we go to prayer tonight, you take your request to God in your heart, and I'm sure the Lord will hear us all. Let's remember Pastor Tony. Uh, no doubt he, his heart is here with us and the requests that were made this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, with grateful hearts, we approach your throne of grace, recognizing, Lord, that when every single one of your people on the face of this earth were to call out at the same time, you could be able to sort it all out. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for us and as us. And our Heavenly Father, I pray tonight, we're so grateful that you've sent Brother and Sister Tika our way. And I pray, our Father, that this time would be a blessing to them and to all of us as we gather around your word. May it exalt you. May it magnify you in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The Ruel Tika family was with us a few weeks ago, and uh, this is his mom and dad that are here with us tonight. Pastor Pio Tika and Yolanda, his wife. And I'm just going to turn the service over to them. He asked me out there, uh, how much time do you want me to take? How long should we go? And I sincerely meant this, until we get done, until God says that's enough. Now that could be 15, 20 minutes. That could be an hour. That could be two hours. Let's just put out of our mind what time it is, and uh, let's worship the Lord. Brother Pio, come, would you? And you, and Sister Yolanda, you do whatever God lays on your heart to do, okay? Thank you, Pastor. Good evening. Every person that comes there and look at me, they smile. It's one thing good with this church, you always smile. And I think, you know, when you smile a lot, uh, only, uh, only 14 muscles are, uh, get tired. When you frown, that is 98 muscles are tired, so you look older if you don't smile. <laughs> and thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity. Actually, we are here with, uh, uh, in, the, in Michigan, Ruel and his family is in Canada, in uh, Windsor, and having some meetings there. My son, uh, another son, Nimrod, is at Wheaton College, finishing his uh, 
a PhD there. He was sent as a scholar. He's uh, speaking right at the uh, state line, after the state line, Ohio. And he will pick us up here after the service, wherever, you know. And uh, we thank God. We came very early here because he, their service there starts at 5 o'clock. And uh, here we start at 6 o'clock. And so the, we drop us here at 4.10. And quite a long time waiting up to 6 o'clock. So my wife called on uh, Margaret and they talked. And uh, it's good that brother, brother Tom came 10 minutes after we were waiting outside. And uh, we are very glad to be here. Before we, uh, we open our Bibles, uh, I'd like to invite my wife, Yolanda, to please play the piano. What, uh, what, is this his piano or the piano or uh, while she is uh, coming to the f- piano, I would like to say that uh, I want you to, I want to thank you all for taking care of our son and uh, our grandchildren. And uh, I used to say that uh, the reason why I don't sing is because they may feel very insecure if I sing. And uh, I don't know why, or maybe I will feel very insecure if I sing. <laughs> we had a duet with Brother Brian years ago. We sang that song's favorite, uh, the song that the choir would be singing. And I, don't where it, I did not know where it went. He was very low, I was very high, but at least we meet at the end. And that's fun. Here's my wife playing the piano, please. I hope it will be a blessing to all of you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Let's open our Bibles, please, in the book of 2 Corinthians. Very great book written by the Apostle Paul. And uh, 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, one of the uh, great chapter here, which um, I, I think one of the most quoted, uh, uh, second to John 3.16, is this uh, verse, 2 Corinthians 5.17. But I'll be reading verses 11 to, uh, to 15. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 11 to 15. And I'll speak about quitting. Quitting. And why we should not quit. <laughs> why can't we quit? And let me read this uh, verse, please. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse uh, 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men... But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them who glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be of sober mind, it is for your cause." For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that he or that they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. Let's pray. Lord, again, we thank you for the freedom. The the United States will be celebrating the 4th of July as a date of their liberation many years ago. Lord, we pray that we appreciate this kind of freedom. And this freedom, freedom is not being curt curtailed by many, many ways. But Father, thank you because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I commit to you our time together, thanking you for this church who love missions and missionaries, thanking you for the pastor, for restoring his health, and thank you for every member. Lord, here we thank you. And as I speak to the ears of these, your people, I pray that you will speak to their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. It's nice to see everyone of you, especially Margaret. And of course, as, I, as my wife have said, uh, we miss Brian. <laughs> He's a good man. But... Uh, uh, as I look on the mission field, and of course here also in the, in, in the United States, I saw many are quitting their faith. They're falling apart. They're apostatizing. They are turning back from God. And uh, they have different reasons for that. And we will not have any reason to, uh, to deal with those things. And I'm sure, the fact is, I'm sure that you know that here, even in your church, you'll find people that are very active before, join the activities of the church, serving the Lord faithfully. And then for some reason or the other, you know, little by little, that, that, that uh, fire from the heart became cold. Many reasons could be said about that. Well, I remember this husband and wife talking together, and you know, they are having argument one Sunday morning. And the wife's probably is more spiritual and said that, let's go to church Sunday morning. And she said, I want to go to church. I don't want to go to church because there's so many hypocrites in the church. They, they will, uh, like, uh, like what we have read in this verse, they uh, look good in the outside but bad in the inside. So I know that so I don't want to go to church anymore. I knew there was a, quite a long argument. And the man said that, give me three reasons. Why I should go to church. And the wife said, well, first of all, you are a Christian. And as a Christian, you are supposed to go to church and serve the Lord. Number two, you are strong and you have all the ability and the, you know how to, we know, you know how to drive, you are strong. So we can go to church. And number three, you've got to go to church and you must go to church because you are the pastor of the church. Stay there. Let's go to church. And that, that shows that even pastors get to the point of quitting, you know. And uh, some of them really quit. So, as I uh, look on the mission field, and consider your pastor who gets some health issues before. I think, what's that, uh, bypass? 
I got a friend in the, in the Philippines who got a quadruple bypass. He's a pastor. And he cannot, I mean, no one can stop him. He still preaches. Preach long, he preached two hours. I said, you got to be careful. You got like, this quadruple bypass, but he still preached an average of hour and a half to two hours his congregation. And they are expanding. Why? And you see, we have all the reason to quit probably. And we can justify our quitting. But my subject will be on just keep on keeping on. And we said, why? Can't we quit? Number one, because of the call. You remember the call of the Lord Jesus Christ has come unto me, all ye that labor and have laid, and I will give you rest. That's one is the call to salvation. <clears throat> the invitation is open. It's open to everybody, to the person, to the to men or women, whoever they are. The invitation to be saved is open. Just come, repent of your sin, open your heart. Turn back your from your sin. Turn to God. And whatever big, uh, niso, bigness of your sin or greatness of your sin, there is no sin that he cannot forgive. There is no feeling in our heart that he cannot wash away by his blood. The blood of Jesus Christ and cleanse us from all sin. And so the first, we cannot, I mean, we cannot get out of that because of our salvation. If you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. Amen. I mean, you are saved. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of God. And I believe that if you feel that you don't want to be saved anymore, you don't enjoy it anymore, I'm telling you, if you are really born again and saved, you cannot lose your salvation. <laughs> I mean, it's forever. The moment you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved and you are saved forever. I remember a man in the Old Testament who got so frustrated with the... <clears throat> With the group he was, quote, unquote, pastoring and leading. And because of that frustration, he faced God and said, God, remove my name from the book of life. Who was that? Moses. What did God say? Okay, I'll, I'll take it off. No. He said, no, I, I will not. In other words, if our name is written there, no one can blot it out. And even God will not blot it out. Our salvation is forever. And thank God when I was 15 years old, I was born in a Christian family. My dad was a pastor. A pastor. He's already with the Lord. And I grew up in a church like that. Even before I was born, I was already attending church. I was in my mother's womb. And when she sat on the front, front row, I was there with her until I was born. The first book that my mom opened to me was the Bible. The first verse was John 3.16. I went to the church. And I thought I was saved. And you, so, you, you see, if you grow, and that's the danger of, being, of growing in the church. You know everything about the church. I was assisting in the Sunday school. I was bringing my, my playmates into the church. And I was receiving many rewards and uh, cards because of this. I, I was winning in the contest. But I thought I was saved. So in April 11, 1958, there was that uh, our... A uh, missionary there, a Filipino missionary, a lady missionary, gave the story of Barnes Barrel. And she told the story. She was this Barnes, Barnes very poor. And I could associate myself with him because we were very poor as a family. And to make the long story short, that, that, that the poor, uh, poor, uh, poor uh, boy attended Sunday school and he got saved. And he got sick and he died. But before he died, he witnessed to the nurses in the hospital. And this verse was, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I got to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So that where I am, there you may be also. The verse again is uh, John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And so she uh, related the story and there was some deep conviction in my heart when the, when the invitation was extended. Suppose you die this morning. Are you sure that you are going to heaven? That's the question. I said, yes, I am because, you know, I'm, I'm religious. I'm a precious kid. And praise the Lord because the invitation was made longer until I faced the reality that I am not sure. So being a pastor kid or a deacon's kid, 
or born in a church is not a guarantee that you'll go to heaven. You get to have that personal confrontation with the Lord Jesus Christ. A personal decision to accept the Lord. And the reason we cannot, we cannot give up is because of that call. Because we are saved. And we are saved to serve. Salvation is just the beginning. That's where you are born into the family of God. It's, a begin, it's just the beginning. And then the continuation will be a faithful service to the Lord. So God is expecting us to serve him faithfully. Now because of that, of that call, call to salvation, call to serve, we cannot give up because when we said yes, we will serve you forever as long as we live till, we see, till I see you face to face. That's a vow, that's a promise, that's the reason why we cannot give up. But the second thing that I note here is uh, we cannot give up, we must go, go on keeping on because of the, of the, I mean, because of the commission. There is a commission, a commandment that was given to us. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20 said, I'm sure you have heard messages about this thing, and uh, uh, that commission says, uh, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all nations. You shall be witnesses unto me. In other words, if you are not a missionary, you are a mission field. So we are expected to go because there is a very important emphasis on the word gospel. There's the word go in the word gospel. So because of that commission given 2,000 years ago, we must go. And that's the reason why in uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the Philippines, we, we go. I mean, when the Lord called me in 1965, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ to serve him full time. And that was, uh, ever since, I never regretted that decision to make the decision to follow the Lord. And in 19, uh, I was pastoring a church already, a small church in our town. That's a church that my dad uh, started. But the Lord uh, showed me a vision. There were, of course, some frustrations in between. I was planning to enroll at Tennessee Temple University, but when I reached the United States, I, have, I was almost enrolled. I had my work waiting there, but uh, the US, United States Embassy did not give a visa for my wife. So it, will be, it was very hard for me to stay maybe two years, three years without my wife in a very strange land. So I said, this is not good, this is not God's will. So I went back in 1976, and uh, uh, there was a man there who got saved in our radio ministry, and he invited us, invited me to go and have a Bible study in their home. One soul. I said, well, there's nothing wrong. He said, I want my family to be saved. So we started a Bible study. My wife and I, every Saturday, uh, Saturday afternoon, we go there, we, uh, we ride a bus and go there through the traffic and through the flood, and uh, uh, we started the Bible study until the whole family got saved. And they were baptized, and the other families joined, and families joined until in, November, in uh, April uh, 3, 1977, we started our first worship service in a small apartment. It was overflow, and it was overflow. We transferred to another place and another place, and then the fourth transfer that we did was to have our own property. Now, the reason why I, uh, I saw the vision of lost people in Malabon, today, they have a population, a small, it's a small city, but a population of more than 450,000. That particular time in 1977, we were the only first Baptist church there in that place. There, there are two, uh, uh, three Roman Catholic churches, two Anglican churches, and the rest are, are cults, and uh, we are the first Baptist uh, church that started a church there. But through that, the Malabon International Baptist Church was born. And uh, today, uh, through that, we started the, in 1984, we started expanding and starting satellite churches. Before, we were using bus ministry, busing in those, uh, those fields. But the Lord convicted me and said, hey, he's coming from the city, and, but you are not reaching the city. You are probably uh, uh, taking about 20 to 25 people every Sunday, but there's a lot uh, thousands of people there, so we started a church there. We had a church there. And to make the long story short, we started 16 different churches. 
1982, we started the, and in 1984, we started putting up an academy because I saw young people, especially children, that's being quote unquote brainwashed by this evolution theory in the public school. They are lost, they don't have purpose. So my wife, who is an educator, we sat down and planned on establishing a Christian school. And so we started a Christian school. And today we have over 500 in this Christian school, from preschool to high school, and we have a special education class for slow learners. Or those that are having people with, uh, uh, with uh, some difficulty in learning. So we started that, this is a hard, a ministry, just easy ministry, because this is not for business. We are the lowest in, the, in, uh, in uh, supporting, and the tuition fee is not very. We have to do that because it is for the sake of the gospel. That is, that's an open door for this uh, child to learn. And then you go into the house, and that's the start. You know, we, we saw movements of families from different religions. To, I mean, last year we have one, one family that came from the Muslim group. And it was a surprise that they enrolled their son in a Baptist school. <laughs> and they heard the message. Every time we have this, uh, uh, this uh, special Sunday for the academy, they are, they are there. They, they will re- hear the gospel. And I wish they will, they will know the Lord. They will come. Now, why, why are we doing this? Because of the commission to go. In 1987, we started the Hiring of Baptist Mission. Today, we have 155 churches with a little over 100 pastors from this group, from, from this umbrella, starting churches from the southernmost part to the northernmost part of, uh, of, our, of, our, of our country. We have churches in the Muslim land. Of course, they have freedom there because uh, so many things, but anyway, we have 12 churches in that area of Mindanao, the southern, southern Philippines. So the Lord is working mightily, and we praise the Lord for that because of that commission. So we cannot stop, we cannot quit, because as long as there are places that open, and the Lord swung open the Philippines for the gospel, it's a very unique, I mean, it's a very unique country today. Not only open for the gospel, but we are the only country pastor. We are the only country in this world that celebrates Bible Week. Now what is Bible Week? It's a law. It's an executive order that every last Sunday of January, every year, every last week of January, the Bible must be read during flag ceremonies. I mean in federal buildings, in government buildings, in schools. And so you read the Bible, you have 15 to 30 minutes to talk about the Bible, read the Bible and pray. That's every day for five days. And then on Sunday, the mayor will attend, as a matter of fact, he will even sponsor, he will pay for those people that will come. Then we distribute free Bibles to this through the Philippine Bible Society. And so the doors swung open <clears throat> in our city, the Malabon city. All the departments from the office of the mayor to the jail, we have a Bible study. To the policemen. In the government, we go to the police headquarters and the, the armed forces of the Philippines, and we go inside there. I mean, even the Department of Education has invited us. Here, you teach value, a value education to our children. Use your Bible, use this thing in public schools. So how can you stop? <laughs> how can you quit? How can you turn your back from these challenges? So we cannot because of the commission. And please pray for us thirdly. We cannot because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, For the love of God constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and he, that means Christ, died for all. In other words, he did not only die for Americans. He did not only die for the blacks or the brown or the red or the yellow or the whites. He died for every, uh, every soul that walks on the planet earth. I mean, wherever you are, whoever you are, he died. God loves the Muslim. God loves the Buddhist. And God loves the cults. And God loves the Baptists. And God loves the Protestants. God loves everyone because God so loved the world. He died for them. Now, who will take this message to these people? Beloved in the Lord, I want to tell you that Jesus Christ has the answer 
for our problems. I'm not saying that you will not have problems, but you see, he has the solution. He had the medicine. Jesus Christ is the solution to the sin-sick world. You know why? Because he got the transforming power. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because this is the power of God unto salvation. So Jesus Christ loves every soul. He is a solution to every problem. And Jesus Christ can turn your pain. Jesus Christ can turn your tears into joy. Your loneliness into laughter. Your, bound, your hell-bound soul to heaven to be heaven-bound soul. Jesus Christ can turn your pain into peace. Your trials into triumph. Your hopelessness to be the hope of, uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. With Christ, we have an endless hope. Without him, we have a hopeless end. So that's why we cannot. What a glorious gospel we have. Amen? And that, that medicine to the sin sick world was given to you who are saved. The transferring power of the Lord Jesus Christ flows to you because someone told you about Jesus. Maybe your mom, your dad, your pastor, anywhere. Like me, I, I, I was saved in the Sunday school. My wife, Yoli, was saved in the Sunday school also in another church. Her father surrendered to preach, and uh, he, was, he was a pastor of the church before the Lord took him. So you have that. And if it is not you, then who? I told our people even here that I am. This is not original. I have heard it somewhere. I just wrote it down. I even forget who said this. But something that you have, uh, that I could think, that I am a nobody, telling everybody about somebody that can save anybody. I am a nobody, we are a nobody, telling anybody about somebody, someone who can save anybody. And I think that is the reason why we cannot give up because Jesus Christ died for all. And number four, we cannot quit. We must keep on keeping on because of Christian partners. So because of the call, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of the commission, because we have Christian partners who trusted us with their time. I thank the Lord for Brian and Margaret. I forget exactly the year when I spoke here. And Brother Brian came to me in the front and said, Brother Tika, we had a long talk and said, do you know of a church that we can build? The Lord gave us the means to build it. I said, yes, there are many, but let me pray what will be the priority. And so he went there, saw the church flooded by that uh, uh, sea flood. It was flooded for three months. Man, he just, you know, just step on those flooded things. <laughs> it was a, a broken church destroyed by the typhoon. And said, uh, brother, brother Brian, maybe this is the church that you would consider. And he called me one time and said, yes, yes, preacher, we will do that. And Brian and Margaret invested their money in building the church. The church building, the Tanai First Baptist Church. We dedicated that, I think it's what, 2011? when they were there, and we dedicated the church for the glory of God. And every person that's baptized there, Brother Brian and Margaret, and some of you that helped, is a part of that. Still standing and still going. They have an outreach now to another, another city. And uh, that building is a standing testimony that our God is powerful, that our God answers prayer, and that our God, we should not stop. We should not quit because of partners like them, partners like you, partners who are praying for us. And I know you, you are praying for us. We cannot quit. How can you quit? Well, Brother Larry could resign because of the sickness. But why can't he quit? It's because of these things. 
Because there are people looking at us and trusting us with their prayers, with their finances, with their money for us to be able to go one more mile maybe through the support you are giving. So we praise the Lord for that. I wish I had more time to tell you about these many things. And uh, uh, last time we had uh, with a lady there in, in, the, in Tanai that, uh, I mean, she lost uh, her focus and so forth. She attended our camp, and of course, she surrendered her life there, and she's very active in the children ministry there. Once in a while, we have, when the Lord provides something, we give the money for them to feed the hungry there, hungry children from the slum district of this town. And every time I go inside there, that plaque right outside, you can always remember Brother Margaret and Brother uh, Brian and Margaret Palmer. And uh, mom, they love you there. They pray for you there. These people are praying for you. Not for, all, uh, not for her only, but for all of us. That's why um, when I make the announcement that uh, Brian is already with the Lord, they were shocked. They said, what? You know, they, he was strong. He was strong when he was here. Now, of course, at that time, I don't know the details yet. But one thing is good. He went to be with the Lord. And he's now with the Lord, with my sister, one of the uh, co-founder with my dad of the church. They're probably, uh, you know, talking about something else. And they have the old, the story and the time to tell. So let's not, let's just keep on, keep, uh, just keep on keeping on because of this, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of the partners, and we have partners like you. How can we stop if there are people like you who say, hey, we will pray for you? And we will be traveling from here. We go back to Indiana. And then from Indiana, we, we go to, to Texas, uh, Arkansas, and uh, up to the Nirvana, the gambling center of that place of the world. And we will ho or hold the concert. Ruel and his family, Nimra and his family, myself, I'll be preaching. They'll be singing and doing these things. Please pray for safety on the roads. Please pray for provisions on the road. It is a long travel. I told my son when he showed me the plan, I said, son, look at me. And he looked at me and said, son, do I look 40 years old? <laughs> I said, son, I'm 70 and your mom is 65. We don't look like that. We look like, I look like 69, but I'm 70. You know? I'll be 71 in August. I said, and this plan, this is for 40 years old. Like you and Nimrod. He said, Dad, he looked at me and said, Dad, I still believe in you. <laughs> and if your son said that, you know, what will you do? You just don't quit. <laughs> you ride on the bandwagon and let's go. And so we went from there and please pray for us. We'll be going back to the Philippines on August 6th, Lord willing. August 1 will be in, uh, in Wheaton, in uh, Wheat Wheaton, Illinois, and uh, prepare to leave. And Lord willing, August 6th will be flying out of the country. Pray for us. And that's the reason why we cannot stop. We must go on because we remember people like you, pastor like Pastor Larry, and all of you here. We are 12,000 miles apart, but we can meet in the garden of prayer. And please be assured, we are also praying for you. And next, we cannot, I mean, let's keep on keeping on because of the coming of the Lord. Do you believe that the Lord is coming soon? Amen? Yes, I believe with all my soul that Jesus Christ is coming. I've studied eschatology and I've been, my, my, my dad has been telling me about the coming of the Lord many, many years ago. And still, this is the preaching, he's coming for sure. The date is not set, and praise, praise, uh, praise God, because the date is not set. But you see, the, the Lord promised this, that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a, uh, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, like a twinkling of an eye, that fraction of a second will be taken. Could you imagine that? He is coming soon. You know, when, when we, my wife and I came to America, our uh, port of entry is Detroit, that uh, McNamara, I think it's McNamara Air, uh, Airport, and we were there. The mayor was not there to meet us. 
The governor was not there. And you know why they are not there? They were not there because they don't even know us. Then we flew from there to Chicago, and in that uh, place, Midway Airport, we were there, and the only people that met us there was my son, Nimrod, and their children. President Obama was not there to meet us. But the point I'm, doing, uh, I'm driving is this. And listen to this, my brethren. At the sound of the trumpet, the King of Kings will meet us there. Have you thought about that thing? That is not only the president. There will come the time that all presidents of, the, of, of every country will have to get down from their throne. The prime ministers and the kings and the queens and the leaders will have to get down from their throne. Why? Because the king of all kings is coming. And he will meet us right there. And who are we to be met by the king of kings? That's beyond the understanding. But praise God it is true. He said, the Lord himself shall descend and meet us in the air. Amen. That's a great day. That will be the day of, great, the day of greatest change. All the sickness will be removed. All the humanities that we have, the corruption will be, play, will be replaced by incorruption, incorruptible things. The day of greatest change, the lame will walk and jump. The blind can see. And... Uh, Someone said was uh, uh, preaching this after the, the message. He said, Pastor, what will happen if like my husband, she's wearing a false teeth, will you think that he will still be wearing the false teeth? That's hard to answer. You know, I did not study that in theology. I said, don't worry, sister. The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. <laughs> But you see, all these corruptible things will be turned into incorruption. A day of greatest change. It is also a day of greatest challenge. Why? Because he may come tonight. And let us be, uh, let us be seen when, the Lord, when we face the Lord. We are doing what he wants us to do. Living the way we, he wants us to live. And of course, thirdly, it will be the day of greatest cry. It could be the day of greatest cry. I thank the Lord because I got my wife, my children, who are all Christians. I got my, grand, my father and my, uh, uh, the, the father of Yoli and his family, or, and their family got saved. We will meet them. But I said this is the day of greatest cry because of two things. Number one, the person that might be left behind may be your son, may be your husband, Maybe someone close to you, your neighbor, your friend, I do not know. But that's the day of the greatest cry because when he comes, one will be left behind, one will be taken. So we cannot quit. Let's keep sharing the gospel. And the second reason is the day of greatest cry is when we face the Lord, we'll give an account in verse, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 10, he, uh, he said here, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the, the things done in his body, according to that he had done, whether he, it be good or whether it be bad. In other words, I will give an account. And that could be a day of greatest cry. First John chapter 2, verse 20, and said, that, that we may have confidence that we will not be ashamed at his coming. Day of greatest cry when he comes and we are not, we are cold, we are lukewarm, we are not really determined to really serve the Lord, and we are not going into the way God wants us to go. And maybe tonight we can ask us a question: Am I doing what God wants me to do? And you can make that decision. Let's keep on keeping on because number one is because of the call, our salvation, our service. Number two, because of the Lord Jesus Christ who died for all, gave himself. Number three, because of the commission he gave for you. Don't think of the thousands and hundreds of people that will be saved through you. Just think of one. One soul. One. And because of the Christian partners like you, we cannot give up. Pray for us. 
And because also Jesus Christ is coming again. Anytime. I hope I will see you again next time. But it may be in this side of glory or in the other side of glory. But the fact is, he will come on the date he said he will come. On the hour he would come, it's in his hand. Let us be prepared to meet our God. I remember a story of a pastor who had uh, actually visited his, a member. I, he, said, uh, he was, an, uh, he was uh, in his uh, middle 40s. And he was given uh, only a few, ye- a few days to leave. He uh, visited the, the guy several times. But that time is very special because he was the, the, the guy was so depressed, restless. And so the pastor talked to him about his salvation. He said, uh, brother, are you really saved? And so he gave his testimony. He says, when I was 17, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, and he came into my heart, and uh, I am saved, pastor. I know that when I close my eyes, I will meet him, I will see him. And so the pastor, then why are you afraid to die? When you die, you'll go to heaven. You'll be with Jesus. And that, that, that man said, hold the hands of the pastor with cold hands. He said, Pastor, I'm facing the ugly face of death today. I am not afraid to die. I'm just ashamed to die. Because when I was 27 years old, I turned my back from serving the Lord. I put my time on the business. I became successful. And now I'm faced with death. I am ashamed to die. Brethren, tonight, if the Lord comes, I pray you will not be ashamed to face the Lord and give an account. And we will hear that blessed word of the Lord. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. God bless you. Lord, bless this message in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. If you noticed, he used the letter C when he was going down through the reasons not to quit. He talked about the call. He talked about the commission. He talked about Christ. He talked about the Christians that are partners. And so one more C for you tonight is we've been challenged challenged by the word of God and I appreciate messages like this because every once in a while God's people need a challenge in our lives I'm going to give you an opportunity most of us will probably never see the Philippines with natural eyes but we'll have an opportunity to be a part of the great work that all of the Tikas are doing in the Philippines by giving financially and helping but as you give financially tonight please understand that that is important but more importantly is your giving every single day as you remember these people in prayer as we call on the name of the Lord and as we ask God to take our friends and use them in our stead when we can't be there. And God, I remember Brian saying so many times, he'd say, Larry, you need to go with me over there. They're hungry for the gospel. He said, all you have to do is just tell them. He said, it's not like it is over here. All you got to do is just tell them about Jesus. And they'll be saved. I don't know. if That's foreign to me. I don't understand that. Because over here, obviously, you all know that people don't like to hear that sometimes. Most of the time. And they won't give you opportunity. Did you hear early in the message that the last week of January every year, it's a mandate 
to read the Bible in public places. It's just becoming the opposite over here, isn't it? They're taking God's word out of the out of the government. They're taking it out of our schools. And then they wonder why things are as bad as they are. But you know what? A part of that is our fault. Because number one, we need to pray. Number two, we need to stand up. And number three, we need to finally tell some folks, this, this is not going to happen anymore. And if, we, if God's people, if my people, God said, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, I will hear from heaven. That's a promise that God's given us, isn't it? And it's no less true today than it was back then. P.O., thank you. Thank you for challenging our hearts, for being here tonight, for being a friend to Lakeside Church. Come on, fellas, and let's just... Uh, you give as God lays on your heart to give, knowing that uh, this family has been such a blessing to Lakeside Church over the years. And what you give will be used for God's honor and for God's glory. Lord, bless what we receive right now. And may you do as you did with the bread and the fishes, that you just multiply it as you would see fit in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be dismissed. Thank you for being here tonight. As you go, go praying, come praying, and uh, think about this in the next little while. I, I'm going to be asking. I'm going to be coming around and talking to some of you, most of you. I believe there's things that God would have you to do in this congregation that would glorify Him, and. Uh, I've got some time on my hands, and I'm going to use it for the glory and the honor of the Lord. And so you pray. Will you do that? Will you pray? And, and don't be afraid. Say, oh, my Lord, here he comes. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I'm trying to get you to do. <laughs> Maybe you might be like Isaiah and said, here I am, Lord, send him to me. God bless you. You're at liberty to go.